According to the latest report of the USDA's Economic Research Service, potatoes are America's top vegetable. Of the roughly 156 pounds of fresh and processed vegetables consumed on average by Americans in 2015, potatoes claim the number one spot at 48.3 pounds per person. This includes fresh potatoes and a variety of processed products such as frozen, canned and dehydrated potatoes and potato chips and french fries. In recent years, California has been the ninth largest potato producing state, with top producing states being Idaho and Washington. Because of the diversity of California's climate, it's the only state which produces spring, summer, fall and winter marketed potatoes. California is the nation's largest producer of spring potatoes, and the majority of California potatoes are spring-marketed potatoes grown in Kern County. Kern County potatoes are normally grown on sandy soils and are planted in February and harvested in June. The Tule Lake region of Siskiyou and Modoc counties produces fall potatoes, mainly russets, which are planted in May and harvested in September or October. This video provides information on how potatoes in the Tule Lake region are grown. More and more people are going away from the farms and, and so we're, uh, to be able to feed the world, we need more and more farmers. So we're actually getting less more farmers, so it's getting to be more challenging to get new young people to come and, and farm. And farming is a pretty rewarding occupation, really. You, you got a different job, different uh, program every day, every minute, every hour. There's always something different, always a challenge ahead. So, and then you're dealing with Mother Nature all the time, so no two years are the same. And so you have to just kind of go with the flow and do the best you can with, with uh, what happens each year, basically, but yeah. it is, uh, farming too is a rural experience, really, you know, everybody knows everybody around this basin, you know, we, there's three towns here and they're, they're all about 500 people in the town, but then you have a lot of people in the rural area that make up and it's a pretty good community. Uh, it's always been a really tight community. Uh, the, the three different towns here, like Merrill is an Irish kind of a settlement. Uh, Molin is kind of a Bohemian settlement. And Tui Lake is kind of a homestead settlement. When they, what they did is they, uh, they let uh, veterans of, of uh, World War I and World War II uh, Put their name in a pickle jar, and and they would pull a, your name out, and then you could go uh, get about 70 to 100 acre homestead. Didn't have anything on it other than the ground, and you uh, actually, I think they paid like $300, and then they had to live on the ground. Then they got two Japanese barracks. As, I think maybe four Japanese barracks, and a lot of them built their houses out of those barracks. Um, yeah, it was pretty. This was the first homesteading was in uh, like the 30s for World War One, and the second homestead around here, which is major one, was in like 47, 48. It's got really good good soil. It's got good climate. Uh, doesn't have very many disease factors because we're, we're high desert climate with less than 10 inches of rainfall a year so our pest pressures are you know we don't have a lot of bugs we don't have a lot of blights funguses we don't have a we have a little bit of nematode uh, problem in the soils um, but um, uh, it's a good growing area for potatoes the only thing about it, it gets cold here and it's a, it's a short growing season. Uh, you know, we plant the first of May and we harvest the uh, first of September. So it's it's a short season, but but crops grow fast here because we're at 4,100 feet elevation. 
so we get intense sun for the through the growing season uh, it makes for uh, uh, good crops and quick crops and and water we we have a big lake upper Klamath Lake that holds oh it holds about uh, 700,000 acre feet of water and then it refills two to three times a year so uh, it there's a lot of water agricultural right now uses about 300,000 acre feet and so most of the uh, the rest of the water goes for uh, environmental uh, we have endangered sucker fish in the lake and then we have uh, uh, endangered salmon downstream so it's been competing interests in the Klamath Basin for 20 years. Fresh market potatoes is a, is a challenging business, There's no question about it. Crop rotation is important to potato production. Most Thule Lake potato farmers grow potatoes in rotation with crops such as alfalfa hay, small grains, and recently onions and garlic. We rotate. What we do is we'll, we'll put them in hay for sometimes as few as five years, but we try to go at least 10 years on a field um, in alfalfa. And then we will come out of hay and go straight into potatoes the next year. Some guys don't do that. They, they want to go a year of grain just to get rid of the roots, but it doesn't seem to bother us too bad. And then after the spuds, we'll go a year of grain. So this field here was in potatoes last year. Um, this actually had yellows and reds in it. And then this is our newest rotation, is garlic. We just planted it. This is our first crop of garlic we've ever raised. Um, so next year, if the garlic thing works out, we'll plant this field here into garlic. And then, then we'll go probably straight back into hay. Okay, so potatoes are once out of many years. Yeah, we, we don't. Yeah, you want to you want to let the ground rest with the potatoes. They they use a lot. Um, they we put it, we leave a lot of extra in the ground. A lot of in is left over in the fresh market potatoes. The the chipper potatoes. Um, those guys they don't leave much in this uh, on in the way of nitrogen left in the soil. So we're. Uh... We're preparing the ground for potatoes, so this machine here is called a rotor rotor tiller type. Uh, it's got uh, blades on it, and it chews up the clods and makes them smaller. Uh, you want you don't want very many clods when you plant potatoes because it they can bruise the potatoes. So this machine here it, it uh, breaks up the the bigger clouds into smaller clouds. We harvested the weed here uh, about three weeks ago. We watered the ground so it works up better. And then uh, we ran a concert till through it, um, uh, which has a disc on the front and two sets of rippers and then a disc on the back. And then, uh, then we're running this machine here now. It's called a spader. And it's kind of like a rotor tiller, but a big, it incorporates the straw into the ground. Goes about two feet deep, two and a half feet deep. And it leaves the soil, as you can see, it leaves the soil really nice uh, for the winter. We'll actually, this ground here, it's a little heavier ground, so we'll, we'll take and make beds up for this ground. So we'll, we'll uh, form beds and then, uh, uh, have it ready for planting potatoes in the spring. 
Once a field has been prepared by this or a similar series of tillage operations, potato seed pieces, which are made by cutting potatoes from last year's harvest into smaller pieces, are planted in the field using specialized planting equipment. These potato seed pieces are often dusted or treated with a material such as gypsum to help with drying and protecting the wound that is caused by cutting the stored potatoes. We use like a gypsum, gypsum, just gypsum powder. And then uh, we use a, a product called Rev. It's an organic product. And it, we mix it together and then it, it sticks on the exposed cut of the, of the potato. And then it helps kind of heal that cut part of the potato. So we're kind of, in the United States, we're probably one of the few spots in the world that cut their seed potatoes. So most countries, they just plant a whole seed, a tuber, because anytime you cut it, you get disease factor in the, that it can infect the seed piece and then make it rot. So, With that, with that powdering and superizing, we kind of help heal that cut wound up, keep it from rot. Yeah. It's kind of a key to seed pieces. If you have too wet a soil too, even if you have all the factors of a good seed piece, it'll still rot the seed piece. If, it, if we got two inches of rain or something and the water stood there for a long time, it would just rot the seed piece. Suberization is the process of wound healing during potato storage, or the sealing off of wounds, cuts, and general skin damage that occurs during storage. The waxy, fatty substance, suberin, is deposited into tuber cells adjacent to a wound, transforming the surface of the damaged area and skin into cork-like tissue. The seed pieces are loaded into the planter's hopper or holding containers and are then dropped or deposited into the soil using either a spiked pick or a suction mechanism that singulates the seed pieces that are planted. So that's a, it's called a Lockwood air cut planter. Uh, so it's got tubes, kind of funnels, and the funnels go down underneath and then pick up the potatoes that they're sucked to the tube and then they come around and then when they get to the certain spot, it drops the suction and drops the potato and lets it go down into the, into the chute. And that chute opens up the area for the potato to set. And then coming behind it, it's got discs that cover up the potato. Either down in the moisture, you got to put it, that seed. There's pretty good moisture there. You want that moisture right around that seed. Then you don't have to water it up. It, it'll it'll germinate and and uh, start making a shoot and with that moisture. Oh, well, with this warm weather, they'll start sprouting here in another week, week and a half. Yeah. Usually, it'll they'll take it like coming out of the ground. They'll they'll be two and a half, three weeks, especially with this warm temperature now. This, this soil is warmed up to maybe like 55 degrees now and we're trying to get in that nine to 10 inch spacing range. So as you can see, we're pretty close. And you want, you don't want skips because you lose yield when you get skips. And you don't want doubles because then you don't get the yield. You get too many smaller tubers. So you want a good accurate spacing like we got right there. We GPS almost even like like the rotor tiller there, he was using GPS to keep track. And when we were working the ground here, we were using GPS. The more GPS you can use, the less extra ground you have to work. So it saves on man hours, fuel, a little bit of everything. So our whole GPS program is, is, ge is geared for efficiency, uh, driver fatigue. So like these rows, He's using GPS right now to make these beds right here on this flat ground. And so uh, he doesn't have to actually look at a line and try to follow a straight line. It, the machine does it. So after we plant these potatoes in about a week or 
two weeks we'll come through with a cultivator on this particular field come through with a cultivator one time heal them up um, lay our solid set pipe out there and we have to put solid set pipe in Klamath Basin because of our cold temperatures so almost every oh I would say for the last month it's almost froze every night this morning was the probably the first morning it hasn't frozen quite a while so we usually get into the 25 to 32 degrees range at night so so we we have to uh, frost protect our potatoes when they come out of the ground and even during the season because we can have frost 12 months of the year here so what we do is we we cultivate we put the pipe out and then uh, uh, we'll, uh, this particular field is a conventional yellow field and we'll, uh, we'll put our uh, herbicides through our chemigation, through our irrigation system. And then, then we don't touch the field again with any kind of herbicides. It's all taken care of then as far as that goes. And then we just water it oh, on a schedule maybe every five days, five to six days, depends on the soil type and the and the plant growth and that so um, and then we just keep them try to keep them healthy and take petiole samples maybe probably in July when the, the the plants will be about two feet tall and almost covering the rows and we'll take some petioles to see where the nutrient levels are and then we can add some nutrients to them as the as the plant needs them my concern is, is I'm, I'm, I'm about 30 acres behind him with the hillers. I want to get that done so that I can get the pipe crews in here and get the pipe on because what we'll do next is once we get the pipe on and flushed out, ready to go, we'll have, come in and do an aerial application of herbicide and it's, uh, you want to get it before the the weeds have started, and as long as you know, then then you don't have to worry too much, you know, about weeds throughout the year. This is our my 45th potato crop in the Klamath Basin. Our family has been growing potatoes here for 85 years. What we did is, you know, last year we were doing the same thing we did this year, and then we. Of course, we grow them, plant them, grow them, harvest them, store them, <clears throat> and then we sell them to different markets. So our organic potatoes go into the organic specialty markets like uh, your Whole Foods and your New Seasons and those specialty sprouts, those, those kind of stores. Uh, although the major retailers are, have a little bit of organics in their stores as well now. but. So Whole Foods is one of our main customers and we ship nationwide to them. And then on the conventional side, we, uh, we actually ship to Walmart distribution centers in California. Our, we ship to the two major distribution centers for Walmart in California. So these yellows will be destined for Walmarts, all, almost all Walmarts in California. So uh, we have uh, Oh, let's see. We, so we do reds, yellows, and whites for Walmart, and they're, uh, of course, they uh, go through the distribution centers in Riverside, California, and McCarran, Nevada, and uh, so we supply them for eight months of the year there. This particular field here will probably, we expect like about a 400, 100 weight per acre. 100 weight uh, is 100 pounds of potatoes. Before harvesting potatoes, the above ground plant vines are killed with herbicide to make harvesting easier. You're just seeing the dead vines. Um, you want to get them uh, killed off and cut so that they don't get hung up in the, in the digging. You can see them coming up the chain and then the dirt dropping through and it just once it gets back to here, it's pretty much been clean. There's still some dirt pods, but for the most part, it's clean. And then those chains on the back take the 
they're called a diviner. They take the vine off the top of the hill. So he's digging, he's digging two rows of French uh, at, at the time with a, a Grammy harvester. So it separates the dirt out of it and vines. This machine's picking up these little potatoes like this. These are called French fingerling. So when you're, when you're trying to pick up a potato this size, and this is kind of some of our market, it takes a machine like this to do that. And this machine here, it actually, you don't have to have a truck alongside it. It's got a bunker, they call it a bunker. It fills the bunker up, and then when the bunker gets full, then you lift it up and then you put them into the truck. This is kind of more of a European process that they do quite a bit. As far as fingerlings go, you don't yield a lot. We try to shoot for like 300, 100 weight per acre. Uh, I think this crop here, these French right now, they're probably doing about 325, 100 weight per acre. So a pretty good crop. And the reason you don't get a big yield because you're trying to keep them small. But we charge a little more for these as compared to like a bigger potato. So these will these will probably sell for 80 cents a pound compared to like a russet would sell for 12 cents a pound. So Hello. these are the standard trailers. That size, the white thing there, that's all the trucks. That. Yeah. You're kind of they're all... relatively small though, right? Uh, because these... they're heavy. Yeah, they'll hold about 250 hundred weight or a little bit more. All right, all right. For each truck. So needless to say that particular a digger or harvester is three hundred thousand dollars, probably. This is about two hundred and fifty thousand. Oh, wow. Yeah, marketing is always it's probably the key. If you're if you're uh, if you're gonna start something, you better find a home to sell it first, because if you just grow it and then try to find a marketing home for it, then it's challenging. So. We've kind of went out and, and, and beat the brush and tried to find out uh, what the customer wants, uh, what the, how much the customer wants, uh, when the customer wants it, and, and then try to match our production to the market. We do a, uh, a bid purchase like uh, three months before we start our contract. So it's a little bit tricky because some, somebody could come in and outbid you too. But we've been pretty fortunate. We've been able to keep that market for like eight or 10 years now. I can't emphasize enough, if you're just gonna grow any kind of crop, you need to, to work on your market side first. Know where your product's gonna go. Try to get, get a pricing ahead of before you plant it and then you know what you're going to get too. So some of those uh, ideas are kind of critical in the, in the whole scheme of, of growing crops is having a home for your product. Of course, harvest this time of year, it's busy. We're, we have three different harvesters going and, and lots of people and our potato packing facility is running as well. And, and so I think for my farm, and and we grow, we farm 5,000 acres, uh, 1,500 of it's uh, potatoes. Uh, so we have a big crew, but uh, to be that kind of size, you have to have good people. We've had people working for us for 45 years. So, you know, it's, it's all about relationship with your people too, but you, uh, you have to have good people in order to get the work done. You know, we try to do things the right way and our, our employees are really good. So they know, know our program, know how we do things and, and they get things done in a timely fashion. So it's, that's probably what we're, we like best about our whole farming crew and family, basically, our farm family. An important aspect of progress in developing and improving potato production systems are the contributions of land-grant university researchers such as those who work with the University of California's Cooperative Extension. My name is Rob Wilson. I'm the director and advisor at the University of California Intermountain Research and Extension Center in Tule Lake, California.
Some of the ways that we contribute to the potato production in the state of California is we do do quite a bit of work with variety development. Currently, the University of California does not have a breeding program in potatoes, but we do a lot of cooperation with other breeders in other western states, including Idaho, um, Colorado, Texas A&M, uh, Oregon, and Washington. Um, and evaluate entries from many different states to see how adapted they are to the California production system. In many cases, uh, we also are looking at ways, if there are varieties that show a lot of promise and potential, looking at ways of managing those varieties um, to maximize their performance under our local growing conditions. The process of our variety development program starts with uh, getting selections from the breeders and many times we put those in small replicated trials and look at those over a number of years look at their yield potential look at their quality um, in our area we grow a lot of fresh market potatoes and uh, especially potatoes so if we're growing those for the fresh market we'll evaluate those on their fresh market characteristics or for growing varieties for processing we'll make sure that they have good processing characteristics such as fry quality and and uh, color and appearance after the processing. So uh, the other thing that we often do is look at their susceptibility to our local pests. Uh, we always are looking for varieties that have better pest resistance, especially to some of the devastating diseases like late blight that we have. Uh, we're also looking for varieties that you know have other benefits such as using less water or less fertility. So after we find varieties that have many positive attributes, we we'll often take that to a next step and put those in larger management studies where we then look at maybe altering things such as seed spacing, looking at different fertilization regimes um, and trying to find how to best grow that under our local conditions. In some cases the way we manage potatoes uh, can be similar to other production regions and other areas we've found that we've had to use our own unique uh, conditions to get the maximum performance. Potato producers get information from us from a variety of sources. In most cases, we're providing written reports that include all the information and detailed results that they're able to obtain, and some growers really like to look at those detailed reports. We also have information that comes out in an annual winter potato seminar that we hold each year. Many times we hold that in cooperation with Oregon State so that we're able to educate the growers throughout the Klamath Basin as many of our farmers farm on both the California and Oregon side of the line. Uh, we also provide information in some of the trade publications and uh, also have information on our website and blogs. Uh, what are some of the things that I'm proud of with regards to potato research? Uh, one thing that we've done is we, I think we've done a good job with uh, managing some of the difficult pests that we have in the area. We've made some advancements in weed control and disease management which has been good and right now we're trying to tackle some some improvement of controlling nematode, damaging nematode pests, especially as fumigants become more restricted and more costly. We're trying to find alternatives such as some of the new nematicides. Another area that we're really sort of going into, which is a, a much different direction than we've gone in the past, is looking at organic potato production. Organic potato production in the Klamath Basin has increased dramatically, and we're looking at many new techniques such as uh, growing cover crops and uh, other alternative management strategies um, to try and meet the needs of a potato crop which is very intensive when it comes to fertility and uh, some of the other needs of producing a crop such as irrigation with organic production practices. We're just going to unload and as they come you can see the dirt dropping through that star table and then they're pulling any of the big clods out that they see, any of the vines, but you can see all the dirt dropping. This is one of our potato cellars. We've already obviously dug these potatoes. We've got reds here and we've got yellow variety on the other side. This is called a Modoc. It's a uh, red skin with a yellow or kind of a white center. If you can see. Um, these are more of our special, one of our specialty potatoes that we do. <laughs> these have just been, uh, all we've done with these is harvested 
ran ran them in here on the out of the trucks. These were raised in the sand, so we didn't have near the dirt that we had in that field we were just at. Um, you can see a few vines in the pile, but <clears throat> it's not enough to really hurt us. These boxes underneath are the air vents, and we have big fans in the back of the back of the alley that will blow air up through the pile. And then we got fans moving in the top also. Potatoes are a very a good crop for this area because it's a very good rotational crop to rotate our ground out. But potatoes are a very high risk crop. You've got a lot of money per acre into them and you're at the mercy of the fresh market. Um, some years are good, some years are not. And they'll fluctuate throughout the year, just a matter of when you sell them. And that's why you want to build a storm as best, best you can, so you can try to hit the market at the right time. We don't have too much bug problem in the cellar. Um, the only thing we will have is over time, these potatoes will start to want to sprout. So we have to put a sprout inhibitor on them throughout the storage life. It'll get probably three to four applications of sprout inhibitor. And that means that these potatoes are only going for consumption. You couldn't use them for seed because we've, we're putting sprout inhibitor on them. These are a Yukon Gold. <clears throat> Um, actually, these spuds on the end might be a different variety, but they're still basically a gold uh, potato. It's a yellow skin, <clears throat> and they have a real gold colored uh, meat to them. Very good mashed potatoes. They'll start running these potatoes real quick. Uh, the hope is these potatoes will be out of here by February. Normally, that's when we can get rid of them. This is our elevator, and we're just piling these potatoes in. For this cellar, these pipes under here are what are going to deliver the air into the pile. This is a pretty unique cellar. You're probably not ever going to see one like this anywhere. It's, a, it's shaped like an igloo, but it's very good storage. It's, it holds about 30,000 sacks in here. We are in the south end of what we call Chin Cellar 2. This is an organic only cellar. And what you're seeing down there at the end are once field worth of huckleberry gold potatoes. There's an organic huckleberry gold. This is one of only two cellars like it in the entire United States. And it's a flume cellar. And what that means is the, the potatoes come into here and once they come in here all of these doors are shut and we never open them again until spring. The potatoes actually fall through these little slats that you see down here on the floor. You've got the sideways slats and then the vertical slats. The verticals pump air up through the potatoes and keep them cool and keep air flowing over them all season. And that's all controlled by a computer system. Once the stored potatoes are ready for sale, they are brought to a packing facility where they are again cleaned, sorted, and bagged for shipment and distribution. These potatoes have come right out of the field and they're getting ready to go through the, through the plant. Before they get out to the graders, they go across these belts, down into a wash pit, and then they come up here to the right in this big giant washing machine where there's brushes that turn around and they roll all the dirt off of them and try to get them as clean as we possibly can. You can see when they come in from the field, we still got some dirt on them. I'm Ken Rutledge, and you're here at Wong Potatoes in Klamath Falls, Oregon. I'm the sales manager, and my job is basically to take the potatoes and the crops that we grow and get them out to distributors and brokers all over the United States and around the world. Each day I talk to people from several different sources, either people who have found us over the website, uh, people who utilize us through Blue Book, and that's how I find a lot of my customers too, and then a lot of it's word of mouth from customer to customer. Somebody calls and says, hey, I heard about you guys through this other group, and how do you, how do you move your potatoes and how do we get a hold of them? So, we ship potatoes from the United States, 
Canada, Mexico, China, all over the Pacific Rim into the Malaysia. So what grows here in Klamath Falls goes everywhere in the world. So we're in the Wong Potato Packing Facility. Actually, the original packing facility was here in uh, 1956. So what we do is we bring our potatoes in from, uh, from the cellars or the field, and we, we have a washing facility. We wash them and polish them, and, and then we go through, it goes through a sorter and grater. We actually have two sorter and graters. One's in Odenburg. It's got infrared cameras and it does uh, uh, sorts out the uh, the coals like a green or a mechanical or something on the potato and uh, and then it'll also sort by size different sizing and then we go to uh, our next machine and it's a optic sorter as well grader it's called a cell x and it it does a pretty good job of sizing and sorting as well. It's got three cameras and it takes a picture of the potato as it's turning. And then it puts it, the potato in different size areas. So we have like, we're gonna say like, uh, like a, B, a C size and then a B size and then an A size and then a baker size. Those are kind of the four sizes that we have for uh, like reds, yellows and purples. And uh, so as we do the different sizes, then we put them in different packages based on their size. So you'll see the different size, and that's what that Celex machine does. It puts them in different sizes. We have people that come behind them and then do some final grading. And then we put them in different box, different packages. So different packages go to different customers. We have a different market and different customers have different uses for every side of the of potato from as small as a marble up to the size of a small Nerf football. Each of them have different uses. This is one of your normal poly packaging. It's a five pound bag. And uh, we use a, uh, a bag that, that uh, inhibits light because potatoes can turn green under fluorescent light or natural light. So this bag here helps protect the potato from turning green. It's got some uh, Ultra Shield technology that uh, inhibits the UV lights from penetrating and turning these nice yellow potatoes green, uh, as you can see. And that, that's what you'll get at the stores is that retail package. And this is what we do here. <clears throat> In our smaller stuff, we'll do like this mesh pack, and it's this is kind of a tri pack, so it has a ruby crescent. It's a pink one, and then a Russian banana is a yellow one. And then it'll have a French fingerling, which is the red one. And this is a one and a half pound package. And we have machines that make this and, and uh, different sizes. We also do a three pound in that. And this is kind of one of our signature packages. Uh, it's a paper package and it's one and a half pounds. Uh, it's organic, of course. Uh, it's our own variety, uh, Klamath Pearl. Uh, it's a great tasting potato. It's, a, it's more of a white. Uh, you can kind of see it. It's white, great flavor, uh, great cooking characteristics. It's a, it's, a, it's a winner all the way around. This video is dedicated to the many creative and hardworking potato farmers, researchers, and industry support partners in California's Tule Lake region who during the past century have developed and refined the production practices and systems to what they are today. Their efforts have led to a very impressive story of agricultural sustainability and innovation.